to uh, click through here and find something. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, what is my hair doing today? Always something. Um, yeah, I'm trying to click through. Uh, let's see if you can see. I wanted to show something related to this home movie. Um, so if we can find it. I, I kind of did an over scan so you could see something, but I'm having a problem finding it where it is. Hold on. Almost there. Almost there. Almost there. This is the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show where we watch uh, a weird thing where I'm on a computer scrolling frame by frame through an old home movie. Trying to make a point, but really, I don't know. All right, and then of course I just went right past it. All right, so anyways, there's a thing called edge codes. I'm trying to find it. Almost there. Edge codes are made by Kodak. So you can see on the uh, left, you saw safety. That's to say that it's not um, nitrate. Film. All right. All right, let me kill this one, I'm sorry. Okay, so <laughs> on the left, you see a triangle and a cross, and we go over to the, hmm? wait, which web, web page, hold on. Um, that's you guys talking. One second, please. I swear this is gonna be worth it, but I don't know. Let's see, where is it? De -de -de. Uh, I'm gonna switch over. All right, there it is. Yikes, what a way to start a Friday. Okay, so what was it that we were looking at? Uh, this. Okay, so we we're looking at a triangle and a cross. So you see here's a list of uh, uh, all the Eastman date codes, and this is something that would be printed on the side of the film uh, when it was uh, created. Uh, and then roughly you can guess that the film was shot around that time. Um, so let's see, a triangle. And across is what year? Huh. I see across. Oh, no. Okay. So it's either 1930, 1950, or 1970. Um, so I'm guessing it's 1930. Because uh, it's not 1950, and it's certainly not 1970. So um, this came into play with the alien autopsy film when... Uh, someone presented this 16 millimeter film and then somebody was looking at the edge codes and saying like, well, it's either one of these three dates. And so it was an elaborate hoax, I think, to recreate knowing that some people would know about the, the edge code. But um, yeah, so we watch old 16 millimeter films and talk about them. And sometimes we talk about them too much. We geek out, as, as it were. Um, another thing I'm gonna show you is the film came in this a uh, special can, uh, and this one was used to be for Jam Handy thing, uh, production, but in it is this, which is a pad that would be infused with camphor. Still kind of smells like it. And uh, it helped the film maintain its uh, flexibility. So it actually kind of uh, didn't succumb to uh, vinegar, uh, because it had this other thing that was kind of helping keep it flexible. So there you go. I haven't even looked at the comments. You probably, guys are going like, what's going on here? Skip is just freaking out. All right. Uh, let's get back to the, some things that we know. 16 millimeter film was made by NASA. Enjoy.
To man, the most important body in space is the sun, producer of thermonuclear energy. It provides him with light and heat and is the ultimate source of nearly all the energy he receives on this planet. Similar to most matter in space, the sun is a giant ball of plasma, or gas, composed of charged particles. Observation of the sun is limited to the solar atmosphere, of which the surface or visible layer of the sun is included. It is within this atmosphere that solar activities occur resulting in interesting phenomena or unusual occurrences. We find that the sun's surface is mottled in appearance and is marked by dark patches called sunspots. These spots appear as whirlpools of hot gas, which originated in the interior of the sun and are influenced by strong magnetic fields. As the gas rises from below, it expands and cools and appears dark in contrast to the surrounding environment. Sunspots appear continuously, but about every 11 years they are more pronounced. The spots come and go, and their existence varies from a few days for small spots to about 100 days for the larger ones. Some of the gases ejected from sunspots become solar prominences, these are the huge flame-shaped masses of hot gas that shoot out thousands of miles from the sun. Large prominences are found in the vicinity of sunspots, and their wildly fluctuating streamers are apparently controlled by the magnetic fields originating in the sunspot regions. Eruptive outbursts of hot electrically charged gases, called solar flares, also occur when magnetic activity makes sudden changes around a sunspot. These flares are visible as brilliant flecks of light which suddenly appear on the solar surface. The energy produced by the magnetic activity from these flares causes countless electrically charged particles to be shot out from the sun and carried by the solar wind to the Earth's atmosphere. The solar wind is an electrically conductive gas that streams continually out from the atmosphere of the sun. As the solar wind flows by the Earth, its tremendous amount of energy shapes and distorts the magnetic field. It compresses the magnetic field on the sunlit side of the Earth, while it extends the magnetic field lines on the opposite side. This fluctuating magnetic field, called the magnetosphere, is that region in space surrounding the Earth which contains zones of trapped radiation with a high intensity of electrically charged particles. Most important of the zones to consider for safe space travel is the Van Allen belt, which was discovered by an early orbiting satellite. The belt consists of large donut-shaped formations of charged particles in the topmost layer of the Earth's atmosphere. It is through the influence of the sun that this topmost layer, or ionosphere, is formed. Composed of electrically charged gas, the layer is mainly caused by solar flare radiation, which drives off electrons from the atoms of the gases, leaving the atoms with positive charges. The electrified air of the ionosphere reflects radio waves back to Earth at various angles, depending upon the wavelengths transmitted. The shorter the wavelength, the more they can penetrate before they are reflected back to Earth. Very short wavelengths are never reflected and continue on into space. Solar activity is also responsible for the auroras, those very colored lights visible in the upper atmosphere. High-speed particles from solar flare activity collide with the atoms of oxygen and nitrogen in the Earth's ionosphere to form ions, or electrically charged atoms. These ions then combine with electrons to give off tiny amounts of radiation in the form of light, producing the aurora borealis, or northern lights in the northern hemisphere, and the aurora australis in the southern hemisphere.
Another phenomenon is the reflection of sunlight from millions of dust particles within and beyond our solar system. Called zodiacal light, we see it as a faint elliptical disk of light around the sun after evening twilight or before morning twilight. The intensity of the reflection is dependent upon the density of the interplanetary dust and the size of the particles. An eclipse of the sun is the most spectacular of eclipses. This occurs when the moon passes between the earth and the sun and cuts off the light of the sun from the earth. When the moon serves as a shield during a solar eclipse, a wealth of information can be obtained from observations of the outer atmosphere of the sun and the zodiacal light reflections. Most celestial bodies are influenced to some degree by the gravitational action of others. For Earth, it is the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon that raises the tides, with the moon exerting more than twice the influence of the sun. We can observe this phenomenon, this lifting force of attraction in the rise and fall of the surface of oceans and seas. The tide occurs twice in each period of approximately 24 hours. Continued study of the sun and its influence is essential to understanding life on Earth. Orbiting satellites are now providing new information on the various phenomena which occur. The knowledge gained may well determine man's place in his universe. Phenomena. Okay. Um, yeah, great. Uh, one of these cool shorts that I did for NC State, uh, they have a bunch of 16 millimeter films that were made by NASA that were donated by an alumni, alumnus, who uh, used to work for a PR firm that worked uh, for NASA. So uh, there's a lot of these little short things that would be shown on television or other places. Uh, here's another North Carolina-ish thing. This is the North Carolina Federation program. They uh, reached out to me at some point and said, hey, we have this closet full of stuff. Do you want it? I was like, sure. So here it is. Enjoy. today can look over a sound or marsh and not thrill to the beauty of wildlife that wings its way across the skies? And whose heart doesn't skip a beat when he sees the inhabitants in their pursuit of living? Some folks think the fields and woods are lonesome places and are afraid of the things they cannot see or understand. The vibrant pulse of life is everywhere in every form. Sometimes we are asked to put a value on our wildlife. Now, of what value is a flock of wild mallards? Perhaps we cannot judge them by weight alone or by volume, for each has a separate life system not always based on man's evaluation. We might as well talk of the value of a sunset or of the freshness of the air. Yet we must realize that in the endless cycle of life, each is but a minute part and that each is a link in the chain that binds together all living things on the earth. Each is dependent on the other to provide nourishment or protection and maintain the continuity of life for the next in line. With such interdependency, individuals are expendable, but as a species, essential. The predator and his prey are each a part of the food cycle. Being held responsible as custodian of these vast and varied forms of life, man has a role that must be one of understanding. He is a protector and guardian, for what happens ultimately affects him. If the tadpole or the dragonfly or the water bug cannot survive in the water, can it be fit for man to drink? These small creatures are the indicators, the foundations upon which man's life is fashioned 
and its quality determined. It's as a great philosopher of our time reminds us, crush a flower and somewhere a star trembles. The richness of the soil and the cleanness of the air determine their quality. Man is part of the system, benefiting from all. His food is from the deep fertility of the earth, from the fish and the fowl. Animals cannot survive unless the air, water and earth are kept hospitable. But we have not always understood these interrelationships. All who saw the beauty of the land also saw a cloud on the horizon. By the early 1900s, the wildlife seemed to disappear. The birds and the fish were being slaughtered. It was the U.S. Army and the commercial hunter who had destroyed the buffalo in order to subdue the Indian. It was the market hunters who profited from the ducks and geese and other water fowl and who sold the passenger pigeons by the barrel. Such destruction was seen and halted, but still, something was wrong. Man somewhere along the way began to mistake uncontrolled growth for progress. Strip mines laid waste to the land. And pollution of all kinds drained into our streams. Abandoned junk began to litter the roadsides and invade the rivers. Detergents and waste fouled our water. Drag lines channelized and drained our rivers and swamps. Air pollution turned fertile soils into deserts and smog filled the air. Wildlife, the barometer of our own life, succumbed. Something was terribly wrong. Could man survive if wildlife could not? Yet we had an insatiable demand for more power, so we built more dams. We continue to tear up the land and through over-harvest make the forest bare dead places. We were following false goals. Was this to be the end of wildlife? We were failing to leave any seed for tomorrow. It was in 1945 that concerned and angry hunters and fishermen confronted the North Carolina General Assembly demanding reforms and a voice in future decisions. The United Sportsmen were successful, banding together the divergent groups throughout the state under strong, aggressive leadership to form the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. Memberships have grown from a few hundred individuals until today its members number in excess of 20,000. It has added its strength to that of the largest conservation organization in the world, the National Wildlife Federation, which boasts a membership of more than 2.5 million, including the support of many who do not even hunt or fish. Individual clubs and organizations, aware of the increased pressure on our natural resources, united with each club electing a representative as a spokesman. Each representative has a vote in selecting a director from his district, who sits on the Federation Board of Directors without pay, volunteering his services. A four-man executive board directs the efforts of the executive vice president. He, in turn, keeps legislative and political leaders aware of the sportsman, the conservationist, the nature lover, and through the publication Friend of Wildlife, keeps the membership informed of what is happening in the political world and to the environmental quality of this and other states. Every year, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation invites outstanding international leaders such as the former Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall, to meet and confer, exchanging ideas and information. Widely recognized as a conservation leader was the late Turner Battle, the single most cohesive force in the Federation's long history. During its annual convention, conservation scholarships are awarded to outstanding youth, but one phase of the Federation's many educational activities, which also include the McLamrock Lecture Program and the INSCO Film Library. Environmental achievement is recognized in various fields ranging from 4-H, Boy Scouts, FFA, wildlife protection, education, communications, to water, air, land, and forestry conservation. The climax of the awards program is the Governor's Award to the Conservationist of the Year, presented to the citizen most outstanding in the cause of conservation. 
This is an important opportunity for the sportsmen, who are the backbone of conservation in North Carolina and the whole United States, to meet and carry forward urgent matters of the environment. The North Carolina Wildlife Federation is dedicated to making the state a better place in which to live and is making some progress. Through its active membership, it has provided the incentive and leadership on dozens of major issues. Not only being credited with such outstanding separate legislative acts as the creation of the Wildlife Resources Commission, control of the misuse of pesticides, the formation of the Board of Water and Air Resources, now the Office of Environmental Management, the protection of endangered species, the establishment of national parks and national wildlife refuges, the opening of new land for public hunting, recognizing the rights of landowners and sportsmen, besides contributing to and participating in national conservation programs. Today, the North Carolina Wildlife Federation is setting the example for the nation in protecting the streams and rivers from destructive excesses in channelization. Today, whether there are bass fishermen, target shooters, hunters of the deer or the turkey, or watchers of birds, by working together, members of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation are taking the lead in keeping North Carolina a decent place to live be it resident birds and animals or resident people. As Henry Thoreau said several generations ago, what's the use of a house if you don't have a decent planet to put it on? Thou shalt inherit the holy earth as a faithful steward, conserving its resources and productivity from generation to generation. Thou shalt safeguard thy fields from soil erosion, thy living waters from drying up, thy forests from desolation, and protect thy hills from overgrazing by the herds, that thy descendants may have abundance forever. If any shall fail in this stewardship of the land, Thy fruitful field shall become sterile stony ground or wasting gullies, and thy descendants shall decrease and live in poverty or perish from off the face of the earth. Um, <clears throat> so someone in the comments uh, referenced a P.D. Pablo lyric about North Carolina, Raise Up. So I am spinning my shirt around like a helicopter. Um, <clears throat> why do I know the lyrics to this uh, rap song? Because the video was actually shot a couple of blocks from here. Um, off of, uh, I think it's Tarboro. But, uh, yeah. So anyways, thanks for that shout out. Um. This uh, film was probably the antithesis of, of that, of the P.D. Pablo video. Uh, all right, let's learn about uh, Wind at Work, uh, thanks to Pat Dowling Films. Enjoy. The wind is at work. It carries a kite into the air. You can feel the strong wind push against the kite and carry it higher and higher. The wind helps an airplane to fly and helps to hold it aloft on a vast sea of air. A bird glides on moving air. It glides on the wind. 
The wind is sometimes strong, strong enough to push a sailboat through the water. The wind is sometimes violent and destructive. The wind is at work all over the surface of the earth, blowing sometimes gently and sometimes violently. Wind is moving air. And to know more about it, you must first know some things about air. Have you ever had a flat tire? There is not enough air inside this boy's tire right now. He forces air into the tire with a pump. Now the tire is firm. It holds up bicycle and boy without going flat. There must be something inside the tire holding it up. That something is air. Here's an experiment you can do. The balloon gets bigger because the man is forcing air into it. The more air, the bigger the balloon. In a little while, the force of the air within the balloon becomes greater than the strength of the balloon. And the balloon bursts. Another experiment shows you an important thing about air. Although we can't see it, we know that this bottle contains air. A balloon is placed over the mouth of the bottle. Now, air can neither get out of or into the bottle. The bottle is placed on an electric hot plate. This bottle is made of a special glass that will not break when heated. As the bottle gets warmer, the air it contains also gets warmer. The balloon swells because warm air takes up more space. It expands. Warm, expanding air rises upward. Now let's see what happens when air is cooled. A bucket of icy water is used to cool the bottle of warm air. Cool air takes up less space. Cool air contracts. The same thing that took place with the air in this bottle, when it was cool and when it was warm, takes place all around the Earth. There is a blanket of air surrounding our Earth. It's called the atmosphere. The atmosphere is constantly being heated and cooled. At times, warm sunlight heats the atmosphere in certain areas. This warm air expands. It takes up more space. It rises upward. Cooler air moves in to replace the warmer rising air. The movement of the cooler air is what causes the wind, for wind is moving air. The winds that sweep across the earth are slowly yet constantly changing the appearance of the land. Nowhere is this more apparent than in an area of sand dunes. When the wind is at work here, the sands shift about, carried along by the moving air. Hundreds of tons of sand may be blown away and come to rest in another place. In time, the land will look quite different than it did before. New, strange forms appear patterned by the restless wind. 
The wind sometimes works for man and sometimes against him. On many farms, the force of moving air is used to turn a windmill and so helps the farmer do his work. But sometimes, the wind that blows across farm areas causes damage to the land. Strong winds may carry away the good soil in which food crops are growing. Then the result of the wind's work is a poor crop for the farmer, or perhaps no crop at all. When the strong wind carries with it fine bits of sand and dust, it can cut and change the shape of the hardest rocks. Many strange rock formations are often partly the result of the cutting action of sand hurled against the hard rocks by the wind. This process is not one that takes place in a few years, or even a few hundred years. Thousands of years have passed since the sandy winds first began to shape these rocks. And the process still continues, so that thousands of years from now, the rocks may look quite different than they do today. One of the most useful jobs the wind does is to help scatter the seeds of plants. The wind aids the common tumbleweed in scattering its seeds. Blown by moving air, the tumbleweed rolls along, its seeds shaken loose along the way. Each seed of the milkweed plant is attached to a feather-like carrier. The wind carries the seeds away to a new area for growth, perhaps a distance of several miles. The seeds of a huge cottonwood tree are scattered by the wind. Cottonwood seeds are contained in small pods. When the seeds ripen, the pods open. The seeds are contained in a cotton-like material that floats away on the wind. The wind serves us in another way, for it helps make the weather. Clouds often form as a result of shifting winds. Many clouds contain water. We see here the effect of the wind in forming and moving clouds. What we are seeing in a few seconds actually took place over a period of several hours. When warm and cool air masses meet, the air often becomes a swirling, unquiet sea of clouds. The clouds grow bigger and blacker until the moisture they contain falls onto the earth below. Moisture that comes as rain or snow, hail or fog, is most important, for it provides every single thing that lives and grows with the water that is so necessary to life. The moving air that is the wind is at work, affecting and changing the earth upon which we live. The wind helps a kite to fly, and helps a bird to glide. It helps an airplane speed through the open sky. The wind pushes a sailboat and brews a violent storm. The wind shifts and shapes sand dunes and changes the look of the land, even the hardest, rockiest mountains. The wind sometimes blows away the good soil from farmland. It helps scatter plant seeds all over the earth. It causes clouds to form and bring moisture to the land. These are some of the ways we can see the wind at work, affecting the earth upon which we live. The uh, 
the guide is uh, in looking at um, the comments. If we start talking about Wondercat and Wondercat has not been shown, then that means that whatever I'm showing is too tedious. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Some of you hate Wondercat. The kids who did the AV Geeks game, there are so many things about Wondercat and about losing your turn, uh, losing multiple turns. Uh, so Wondercat, even among kids, does not, what we say, test well. Um, so uh, I'm not showing any Wondercat today. I'm sorry. Not going to happen. I am going to show a real talking, singing action movie about nutrition. I've shown this like two years ago, uh, but I'm trying to pan out, uh, filter out uh, potential uh, song candidates for uh, the toe tapping tournament, which we're going to start next week. So this is, yeah, a real talking, singing action movie about nutrition. Enjoy. Then we got this fantastic idea. We'd make our own film and show what we learned and what it means to us. Real time movie about nutrition. Which scenes we made showing it's fun to do things when you... Great! Our cameraman, Freddy, really outdid himself. His photography makes hiking look beautiful and easy. Ah, backpacking. That's what I like to do. Why? Makes me feel good. Nothing but earth and sky around. Yeah, but you have to be in good shape. Sure. That's energy. That's beautiful. To me, that's fun. Your mind says, hey, body, make that slide. And your body says, okay, watch this brain, and zap, you make that slide. It's fun. Yeah, it's good to know your body's ready. Ready? Yeah, it's a good feeling, being ready. That's why people stay in shape, right? To be ready. Hey, there's Mike. Whack it, Mike. Now go, Mike. Run! What's wrong with him? Maybe he's letting the ball beat him to tell us something. Easy out. Oh, Mike. No energy. Sometimes I like to run. Just run. I'm walking, and all of a sudden my body just wants to run. It really makes me feel alive. Soccer I love. Fast game. Here comes Mike. Oops, no coordination. Do you like skiing? I never tried it. I think I'd be scared. I think I'd be, well, I'd fall a lot. Here's my sport. It's good exercise, too. To me, it's just fun. Water I like. I even like to take baths. With you, rubber ducky. Who's that? Oh, that's Debbie. She's very shy. She's self-conscious about her skin. Pimples, huh? Some, yeah. And her hair just sits there, she says. Pretty dull. Her posture's bad, too. And you know, the more self-conscious she gets, the worse her posture gets, and the worse her posture gets. The more self-conscious she gets. Yeah, too bad. She's a good diver, but I guess she's too self-conscious to go up there. I bet she'd do it if she were alone. Look at that. Now she's alone. Ah, food. We sure got hungry making these scenes. Hey, there's Mike again. There's Debbie, too. Do they know each other? No, but I think they're going to meet. She needs a napkin. He needs the ketchup, but she's too shy to ask, and he's too tired to get the ketchup, so I guess they won't meet after all. Is that all he's eating? That's probably why he's so tired. Well, it's up to him what he wants to eat. Look at Debbie's lunch. Same problem. 
Maybe that's what they like for lunch. Yeah, well, it's not just their lunches that are keeping them down. There are other things, too. Take Mike, for instance. He grabs a sweet roll for breakfast, doesn't eat much for lunch or dinner, but then late at night, he really snacks up. Pop and candy and other stuff. So? And Debbie is up every night with the late movie. She can never go to bed without knowing how it ends. And if she keeps piling those chips in, 11 calories per chip, you know what they'll call her. Here comes big... But if that's the way they want to live, let them. Yeah, maybe Mike wants to be tired all the time. Maybe Debbie doesn't care about the way she looks. Or maybe they just don't know any better. See, nobody's telling them how to live, or what to eat, or when to sleep. It's all up to them, and that's fine. But at least they should have all the facts, right? Then they can make their own choices. Yeah, they should have all the facts. Hey, Mike. Listen, Mike. You too, Debbie. We think you should hear a few facts. Do you know what a balanced diet means? Stay awake, Mike. The food you eat becomes you. Different foods have different jobs to do in your body. She sure smiles a lot. The body needs a variety of foods every day. A little of this, a little of that. Good old food. It needs the nutrients that food gives. The what? Nutrients. Vitamins, minerals, proteins, carbohydrates. Things that keep the body growing and going and feeling great. You can't get all you need from just one or two kinds of food. Right. You have to balance these foods. Aw, oh, she's too much. Because you get something valuable from each kind. Foods for muscles and growth. You should have at least two servings of meat and similar foods every day. Foods like this. That's what I like. And that's what I like. Some people don't call fish meat, but it is because of what it does inside your body. And look, beans, peanuts and peanut butter, sunflower seeds, all kinds of seeds and nuts, lima beans or butter beans, split peas as in soup. These all have some of the same nutrients as fish and meat, such as protein for one, What's protein? That's protein. There. Building up muscles and other tissue. Helping the old body to repair itself and grow. Now it's my turn. Oops. We started a little too soon. You need bread and cereal for energy. That's this stuff. Breads, breakfast cereals, food made from grains. They have the carbohydrates that have the calories that the body needs. Energy is really what I'm talking about. Wow, look at that energy. But remember, one kind of food can't be a whole meal. You need a variety that works together in your body. Debbie, you got it so far? Mike? Dairy products for teeth and bones. Ah, milk. Milk is so quiet and friendly. Oh, come on. And it gives you calcium, which gives you strong bones and teeth and a better smile. It also has vitamins and a lot of other healthful stuff. You should drink about four glasses a day. But you can substitute other dairy products for two of these glasses, like cheese and ice cream for one, or a milkshake. Okay, where's the card? Very clever. I bet you reversed the film. Fruits and vegetables are body regulators. There are a lot of different vegetables to pick from here. Carrots, cabbage, lettuce, and spinach. Or maybe your favorite is squash and mustard greens. Then there's broccoli, kohlrabi, and artichokes. Maybe some things you haven't tried. Vegetables supply minerals and vitamins A and C. Protective vitamins that help keep our vision good and our bodies well and strong. These fruits are body regulators too, helping us stay healthy. Try some mangoes, papayas, rhubarb, some new stuff once in a while. And look at all the citrus fruits, oranges, Grapefruits, lemons, limes, and tangerines or mandarins. Citrus is one of the best sources of vitamin C. What's vitamin C? This is vitamin C. Healthy tissue in the tendons and blood vessels. You can't have good teeth and gums without vitamin C. The old time sailors found that out. Ever heard of scurvy? Yuck. That's the disease they got when they went out to sea for months and months without citrus fruits. What a scurvy crew. And look, 
Vitamin C is there in your bones and teeth, too. The most fragile part of the bone is at the joint. Here, the growth plate. And that's where we need the big C for growth and strength. Are you watching Mike and Debbie? These people are in shape by choice. And it's your choice, too. Yeah, it's up to you what you pick out for a lunch or snack, or how much sleep and exercise you get. But I think it's a good idea to listen to what your body is telling you. What's it telling you? That it wants to be ready. Ready to jump and run and ride a bike and dance and take a test and, and to do whatever it has to do. And to be proud of how it looks and feels. What do you mean, take a test? The brain's part of the body, too. The way you eat, sleep and exercise affects the way you think. I never thought about it. Sure, being able to study, to concentrate on a good book, to make sense and think fast, that's being ready, too. Now, Mike, that doesn't mean you have to give up eating fries. Just eat them as a part of a balanced meal. Some people say they don't like vegetables. Bet they would if they tried some new ways to prepare them. And there's a lot of stuff like this you can grab for a snack that isn't just sugar and filler. Try fresh vegetables and fruits and great drinks. You can make your own. Like berry frost, fresh lemonade, banana orange flip, energy nog. Where are Mike and Debbie? There, in line, deciding what they're going to eat. It's your choice, Mike. Think about it. The chips will taste good, give you 115 calories, but not a lot of other things that your body really needs. The orange will taste good and give you 65 calories. Those aren't just words and symbols. It all translates into the things your body needs. Wow, look at the vitamin C in the orange. Enough for the whole day. Debbie, it's up to you. Remember that you can afford more calories if you're going to be very active. But calories you don't use are stored as fat. And think about those nutrients you need. In your case, Debbie, you could reduce the number of calories. I guess you might ask yourself, like when you're getting your lunch or a snack, what's this food going to give me? Energy and good health? Or extra weight and bad skin and the big yawns? I wonder if Mike and Debbie have changed it all since they got the facts about nutrition. Hey, super people, isn't that going a little far to make a point? I'd say Mike looks better. A definite improvement. Yeah, he's awake. Look at Debbie. She's more confident now, and it shows. They made a few changes in their food, sleep, exercise, their own choices. Nobody can really make them for you. Hey, now look, look. Isn't that great? He's borrowing her ketchup. Oh, she's asking him for a napkin. Isn't that wonderful? What do you think this is, a soap opera? This is our film about nutrition. Sun comes up, the day has begun. We've got a good start to a day full of fun. Just one thing that most of us know it's important to eat right if we want to go to have a fun fun day you get it puts a smile on your face and it keeps you way ahead of the race get with it now wake up and shine a healthy body means a good good time so have a fun filled day la 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 just one thing that most of us know It's important to eat right if we want to go To have a fun, fun day You gotta choose your food the right, right way It puts a smile on your face And it keeps you way ahead of the race Get with it now, wake up and shine A healthy body means a good, good time So have a fun-filled day, la la, la 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 Um, so was that a toe tapper? Feels like it was. I could try to find a better copy of that. I might have another copy, um, so it's not broken up. But honestly, with a title like Real Talking Singing Action Movie About Nutrition, I figured there would be a lot more singing than just that song at the end. Um, so I was a little disappointed in that. Um, 
So the other thing we have is a bunch of uh, songs from the Mulligan Stew series, uh, of which we only had one that we competed with uh, two years ago. Um, so maybe next week, before we actually start the tournament, I might pull a couple of those and let you vote on them. Um, in the meantime, uh, this we showed this, I think, last, last week. Um, my uh, intern, Mari, did a visit to the or she did a TikTok video about the archive and some of you saw it and loved it. Uh, I certainly loved it. And so this gives you a sense of what a day at the archive is like for Mari. Um, so let's watch it again. Enjoy. Hi everyone. This is a day in the life of an intern for a film archive in Raleigh. So yeah, I show up to work at 12 and my boss hands me a reel that needs to be broken down from some films I had pulled from him a couple days prior. I place these films on that reel and these are the films I'm actually putting back to, back in. I grab one of these gray reels from the respective camps that I just showed you guys, which belongs to one of the films that I'm going to be putting on here. So yeah, I place a little pressure stopper which makes the film not come off of this spinny thing. Place the other reel back there with perps facing away from me kind of a rule in archive stuff. I never have the purse facing towards us. Then I put the other pressure thing to make sure that the film reel does not come off. I connect these with tape so that I can make sure that the film from the other reel is coming to its respective film reel so that it can go back in the can and be shelved properly. This took me a little longer than I anticipated, but that's basically what that looks like. That's the connecting there. So then it's a spinning process and I have to place pressure on the other reel so that it doesn't go too fast and the film doesn't get messed up. As you can see, I'm looking down at the film, watching out for an area where the film becomes, I get to the end or the start of the prior film and the end of the other film because that's where we splice them together. So you can see I'm slowing it down and that yellow and white is basically what I'm looking for. So I disconnect these films. And then I grab the film, tape it back on to its respective reel, and I take off the reel, take off the pressure thing, and I put it back in its can, because that is the reel that it was supposed to be on. So yeah, I believe this film was Comets, Meteors, and Asteroids. Um, but yeah, I basically do the same thing for the other film, put it back on this reel. As you can see, it's a huge arm workout. And I was supposed to stop it sooner, but then it started getting a little fast. But yeah, then I place the pressure thing off and then I grab the respective can and make sure that the film is taped down so that it does not get messed up in the shelving process and doesn't get tangled up with the other parts of the metal reel. As you can see, I put it back in this plastic can and it's going to go back on the shelf immediately. But first, I'll show you guys kind of where I do most of my work. Hello, E.T. But what you're seeing right now is basically the archives collection of films, and I'll show you the different things. So this is the small plus room, which are the small, or the sizes, the medium films on the right, size between small and medium. This is the small room where I'll turn on the light, and you can see there are a lot of small cans. Small meaning shorter reel, shorter film very uh you know basic understanding of that i turned the light on for the medium room which is extensive it's probably our biggest collection to be honest uh, besides the stuff we have off-site but yeah you can see these are bigger reels and the smalls and the small pluses um but yeah so then from the films that i had pulled or that i had put back on the reel i place bm which means black magic the machine we use to scan the films and lunch because that's when my boss scanned them and i'm going to search these films on the database which shows yep M102.1, so then that means I'm going to put them back on M102.1, and I use a steps tool because I am incredibly short. Um, but yeah, there's no, they're, they're alphabet, alphabetized, but they're not like Dewey Decimal or anything like that. The next thing I'll do is search for more films to basically build another similar reel for my boss to continue scanning. So I grab two films that I remember that I had been able to build a reel for him, so then I do that before lunch. Then I eat my lunch and basically I have a protein pack, a salad from Aldi, some chips, and I think some cucumbers with ranch that's not shown. It's very delicious. Then I check in on my coworkers. This is Kayshawn's office space. He does a lot of scanning and a lot of other cool stuff, but that's his really cool machine as you can see he's scanning as I took this video. Um, that's the cool film that connects there. Um, but yeah, the scanning process is difficult, hard, and but all my you know coworkers do it. Um, but yeah, this is Ryan, my other coworker, who was scanning another film in the process. And this is Skip, who was reviewing some footage from his uh, live show and live stream. Um, but yeah, so this is me basically building another reel for Skip to um, scan. And Skip was my boss in the prior video um, for him to basically build up 
or build up some footage and digitize it on and put it on our website. But yeah, so this is me taking out some more films from the shelves to basically check them, uh, check the label, make sure everything reads correctly, make sure the info is in the database. It's a very extensive process, but I've been working on it for a couple months. So basically I take a film, I check the title, I open up the can, make sure nothing's rusted, nothing is uh, oily, vinegary. Um, sometimes you have to smell them to make sure they're fine. And then if they're all good and nothing's wrong, you should check the database. And once I check the database and make sure it's in our system, basically put them on, put the correct location for them. And that's pretty much what I do in the day of a life as an archive intern. It's Yes, she has many TPS reports that she has to do. Uh, and uh, she does have a bad case of the Mondays on Mondays. Um, thanks for watching that. Thank you, Mari, for making that. Uh, somebody pointed out that TikTok might go away in the United States. Um, it is running the app is a horrible security issue. Um, and uh, the company, company uh, is very fast and loose with how they share their data. Um, so what that means is if there's anything on TikTok that you put up, you should make a copy of it. Uh, and so we have this copy. It's not just on TikTok uh, because that platform might go away. Might go away in the United States. Um, anyhow, thanks for tuning in today. If you like what you saw, you can donate by uh, going to ko-fi.com slash abgeeks, patreon.com slash abgeeks, or you can also... Um, hit the super thanks button. That's a great way to uh, also support us. But you can also watch the YouTube videos. Uh, they have ads on them, which are annoying, but um, they pay the bills too. So everybody have a great weekend. It's going to be warm here. It's already, I'm all sweaty. Um, so it's, it's definitely spring and now it's kind of uh, catapulted into summer. Um, so the pollen is killing me. But everybody have a great rest of your day, and as always, please rewind your thing and love each other, and we will see you on Monday. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.